Hi everyone, thank you for joining today. Uh, it's just starting off, we'll give it a minute or so for people to um, people to register it and sort out their audio settings and then we'll kick off. Okay, well, thank you. We can see the numbers are climbing, they're climbing fast. We've already got over 300 people on here, so we will give people a minute to join. Um, but first of all, welcome to today's webinar. It's hosted by Technology from Sage and Sage Campus, which will give you an intro to both of those uh, with our excellent guest speaker who you can see, uh, Dr. Leo Lowe from the University of New Mexico. Um, before we start, a little bit of housekeeping. So please check your audio and visual settings as you join. And if someone in the chat box could just say, we can hear you, we can see your slides, we can see your faces, that would be really helpful. Um, also, if you're having any difficulty, we suggest leaving Zoom, rejoining, it prompts you on the join to uh, select your settings and your audio settings. Um, the webinar is being recorded, so it's being recorded as of now, and you will be sent the, um, the webinar recording in two days after the webinar, roughly two days after. Um, and certificates will also be provided because we had lots of people ask about the certificates. Uh, throughout the webinar, please ask questions. Please talk to us via the Q&A box. Uh, we have a monitor uh, who I'll introduce in a second and we'll either answer them in writing via the Q&A box or live in the Q&A session at the end. Um, and Leo and I were just talking, we're hoping to, our ses sections will finish a little bit earlier. So there's lots of time for questions. Um, the recording will also be on the Technology from Sage website which we'll put the link at the end of this, uh, at the end of the webinar, but if you Google technology for Sage, you'll get it. So you can go there too. And if you're having any difficulty, there should now be, I'll just check it's working, a live stream available on the Sage YouTube channel. Uh, Cause we had so many people registered today. It's really obviously a hot topic. Um, we should be able to account for it just in case anyone's having trouble with Zoom. It's also over on the YouTube. Uh, Maria, if you do manage to tell me if it's, I'll pop the link of the live stream in the chat, I can get it if not. Um, I'm not sure which views you've got. Oh, it is working. I can just check. I'm going to pop the link in the chat to everyone. So bear with me. Oh, and thanks everyone for saying hello and saying where you are. Okay, so if you can see us and hear us, no need to go to the live stream, but just in case you're struggling, the link's in the chat. Okay, so let's kick off. Introduction. So I'm Amy Sparrow. I'm your host today. I'm the Head of Product Marketing at Technology from Sage. And I'm not sure everyone on the call will be familiar with Technology from Sage. Uh, you're probably familiar with Sage Publishing. Uh, Technology from Sage is a division from Sage Publishing uh, that amplifies the academic library through technologies. So technologies that improve the patron's workflow, make learning research easier, and, and also put your library back into the heart of patron workflows where they are on today, which is really online. We've got Maria. Uh, the senior marketing manager, she's more than the senior marketing manager for just Sage Campus, but I've written Sage Campus here because that's what she'll be speaking today. Maria's moderating the chat and the Q&A. There is a lot of, lot of people on today, so we're sorry if we can't respond to you instantly or if not all questions get answered. We're going to capture them all and try and um, answer any in a follow-up blog if we miss any. And then most importantly, Dr. Leo S. Lowe, who is the Dean and Professor um, of the College of University Libraries and Learning Services at the University of New Mexico. So if you're not familiar with Leo, he's an expert in AI literacy and education and libraries and is president elect of the Association of, uh, Association of College and Research Libraries, ACRL. Um, and Leo is the instructor of the New Sage Campus course, which we'll be talking about today, and you'll be learning some lessons from that course today. OK, so what is going to what are we going to cover today? Uh, start, of all, start off, I'll do a bit of an introduction very quickly on the chat GBT challenge for libraries and um, for students and researchers. A quick intro to Sage Campus and sort of the need for the structured learning, the structured content for these types of topics. Um, I'll then hand over to Leo for the bulk of the webinar about the art of chat GBT interactions, which is the name of his new course. And then I'm going to do a little demo at the end of Lean Library, which is a technology from Sage product. I'll tell you what it is and show you what it, why, what we've done with the course, why we've integrated, and essentially that we can now surface that course on the openai.com domain. So as you're trying to use ChatGPT, 
you can get this instruction. And then the live Q&A, we're hoping this will be kind of the bulk of the session. So let's see how we go on with times. Okay, so chat GPT challenge for both students and researchers and libraries. I'm gonna pause here to run a poll because we have a real mix of people on the call today. Uh, so bear with me while I get it up. Um, yeah. We wanna know a little bit about our audience. So I'm gonna launch. Maria Leah, can you see the poll on the screen? Yes. Yes, okay. So yeah, tell us a bit about yourself um, and why you joined the webinar today. I think we have a real mix of students, researchers, library staff, um, and some other I can see as well. I'll give it a minute. And can people see the responses? Sorry, I can't see on the back end. Can we see those percentages moving like I can? No, okay, yeah. so let me share the poll. I can see it on my end and I'll, I think when I press end, I can show everyone. But just as a headline, we've got about 53% who are saying they're students and researchers and want to learn ChatGPT. We have 5% in the library staff who are interested in learning ChatGPT themselves, and then 25% library staff wanting to learn how to help students. Um, and then we've got other, and so I'm sure there's some chats going on here. So I'm gonna end the poll and sh ah, I can share results there. So here we go. You should be able to see it, yeah, go. And um, so here's the result of who's in the room. So lots of people here and lots of the content we're covering is gonna be very relatable for all of you. So kicking off, and we've got a couple more polls running throughout as well. So kicking off, what is the ChatGPT challenge? So on the left, we have our students. And the challenge for them, if my animation works, is that AI and tools like ChatGPT, they present this big wealth of opportunity. We know they can achieve a lot with it, but it also presents big challenges around ethics, around compliance, around what they can and can't do. Um, and also they need the skills and knowledge to use ChatGPT and other AI tools well, without disrupting their workflow. And what I mean by that is, if they're studying, if you're writing something for a paper, whether you're a researcher, whether you're a student, whether you're doing it for your actual job, you're in a workflow, you're in flow, uh, you're on your website, having to leave that workflow to gain those skills to learn ChatGPT or learn what to do with AI titles. It sort of takes your flow, it's tricky, it takes time. Similarly for librarians, they've got a couple of different challenges. So one is curating this ChatGPT guidance materials and content finding good content, finding um, the right voices in the space. And then the sort of second challenge, which is almost bigger, is delivering that content to patrons at the right point in their workflow. When we know 78% of library patrons actually start the discovery on Google, that's from a librarian futures report. So they're not actually starting in the physical library or the library website or the discovery layer. They're on sites like Google, PubMed, God, God forbid Wikipedia, but also, or starting on ChatGPT themselves. And I'm very interested to see there's some new studies coming out about how many students go straight, chat, uh, straight to ChatGPT when they're starting anything. So a little teaser of why Sage Campus and Lean Library are talking today. So Lean Library being a technology from Sage product is we see ourselves as this two joint um, parts of this. So one is the content. So Sage Campus is an online learning provider for skills and research methods with this Sage quality content and then Lean Library is the tech answer. Uh, so it brings library services and content to where students are online today via a browser extension. So let's do Kate the Sage Campus first. Um, and then people might be very familiar with Sage Campus in the call. I'm not sure um, who the audience is. Please talk in the chat. Um, so Sage Campus is a Sage product for online learning for skills and research methods. It teaches the skills needed to succeed at all these stages of the academic workflow. So that's from data literacy, information literacy, to research skills, to getting published, the whole way through to data science skills. And what it is, so Sage Campus, if I go to the next slide, um, currently has over 40 online courses. I think Maria will correct me, I think it's over 43 now, <laughs> or three are coming this year. Um, and their online courses are fully self-paced, which means they're not live. You go in and log and take them as you want. Um, they're structured. They um, are instructor-led. So one of the instructors you're looking at today is Leo. And they're an engaging mix of stage quality, text, content, video, 
interactivities, formative assessments, um, and are really academic rig academically rig rigorous. Uh, the topics cover these critical skills and research methods that take more than a book to learn, or maybe more than a video to learn. Those things that really take practice, they really take honing and a sort of different pedagogical approach. Um, and the 40 or over 40 online courses equate to over 280 hours of learning. So what we're talking about today, let's go, that's the short intro for me. But what we're talking about today is the art of chat GPT interactions, which is Sage Campus's new online course with Leo Lowe. And I won't go too much into the course content because Leo is about to, but Sage Campus, for those who don't know, is a subscription product in that libraries, academic libraries subscribe, they get institution-wide access. But because of how important this topic is and how much students and researchers need to learn this and how much librarians need to support their students' researchers, this is freely available. So anyone can take this course, and Maria, if you want to drop, drop the link in the chat, maybe, and we'll also send it in the follow-up. So without further ado, over to Leo. All right, thank you so much, Amy. Um, and it's great to be here and to see so many people from all over the world, so it's great. Um, before I even begin, and Amy, can you put up the first poll so we get a sense of uh, where you guys are? Um, and as we go do that, I'll just quickly introduce myself a little bit. Um, so I am Leo Lowe. I'm the Dean of the College of University Libraries and Learning Sciences at University of New Mexico in the US. And right now we are uh, working on helping our students and faculty upskill and learn more about AI. So, and that's what I'm being really actively involved in. Um, so here you can see a uh, poll. Um, Quick, you can kind of answer that, and you, we can share that in a, in a in a second. Um, how familiar are you with ChatGPT or other similar language models? So Answers, give it another answers are coming second. in hot. Yeah. yeah. So um, we call this um, course. Okay. Oh, let me take a look at that first. Oh, interesting. 15% uh, have not used, have not tried it yet. And then most people have used it a few times. And then some have used it regularly, but very few are experts in it. Uh, yeah, not that, I mean, it's so new, right? So we're all learning in a way. Um, so can we go to the next slide? And that's why we created this course. It's a mini course. It's called the Art of GPT Interaction. Uh, even though we just say ChatGPT is really for any kind of large language models, ChatGPT is just the most you know well known one. That's why we just call it that. And it's really designed to provide uh, learners with the foundational skills and knowledge needed to effectively communicate with GPT or any other language models. Um, so, and the course is structured into two main modules. Uh, module one is understanding and working with ChatGPT. So it's an introduction. It covers the basics of how ChatGPT functions, inc including its kind of predictive modeling and have some contextual understanding. And then you learn a little bit more about the prompts, the relationship to, between prompts and outputs. Uh, and also we introduce a framework that I developed called the CLEAR framework as more of a systematic approach to crafting effective prompts. Uh, there are exercises and, and, and reflections to kind of reinforce learning and understanding. And in module two, we go in depth into that framework. Uh, we go into each component of the, of the CLEAR framework, and then you can kind of uh, apply uh, uh, the learning and kind of start writing uh, concise, logical, explicit prompts to get more, uh, hopefully, you know, better results for the outputs. Uh, there are hands-on practices, um, and also the module touches on uh, the ethical uh, considerations of using generative AI tools like ChatGPT. Um, so why don't we put up, uh, well, so today I'm going to talk about two of the components in, in the mini course, it's, which is the, the relationship between prompts and outputs and, you know, responsible use of ChatGPT. At this point, Amy, can you put up the second poll question? I'm interested. Sorry, bear with me. Oh, it's all right. 
Go At ahead. This point, I am interested in finding out a little bit more about what do you find most challenging when interacting with AI tools like ChatGPT? If you have never used it, don't worry about it. But if you have used it even once, you know, let me know. And Amy, we can probably go to the next slide if that works. Okay. You guys still answering the poll, but give it one sure. second. We've yeah. got good numbers, and then I will share those results too, so people can see it's a real spread. Yeah. You should be able to see the answers Look. there. Crafting prompts, 36%. Understanding it, how it generates responses, 13 And then another 36 for interpreting, evaluating the quality of outputs, yes. And adapting prompts, and then 15 Yeah, it's a real spread, uh, which is great. I think this uh, mini course can help you with all of them, actually. So um, how do you recommend you checking it out? But today, we'll talk a little bit about the relationship between, you know, um, Prompts and output, which address understanding how GBT generate responses, which I think is an essential step in learning how to craft good prompts, basically. So uh, a little bit about, you know, the predictive modeling and contextual understanding. Uh, so a model like ChatGPT operates on what is known as predictive modeling. It involves analyzing a lot, enormous amount of text and learning how words and phrases typically follow one another. It learns patterns, it learns probabilities. So using this knowledge, it predicts and generates text that is coherent and contextually aligned with the input it receives. And contextual understanding further enhances this by allowing it to not just consider the immediate text, but also the broader context provided. That means that it can handle more complex interactions that require understanding past interactions or, or specific nuances of conversation. So the role of prompts in shaping output, prompt, prompts acts as a direction or, or questions posed to ChatGPT. How specific and clear your prompts are directly influence how accurately uh, ChatGPT can meet your, your needs. For instance, a very vague prompt can will probably lead to a very broad and general response where a specific one can yield a detailed and targeted answer. And understanding prompts is just one part of the equation. Well, let's look at how GPT focuses on the most relevant parts of your prompt. And that's called attention mechanism. Think of these as a spotlight that the AI shines on the most important words in your prompt to determine how to respond accurately. So this spotlight helps the model decide which parts of the prompt should weigh more heavily in generating the response to ensure that the output is relevant and focused. So while these mechanisms are powerful, they rely heavily on the quality of the training data. So you probably have heard a lot about um, uh, the issues of how they acquire or use all, uh, the, the data for, for training these models. Um, and the data used to train uh, these models really affects its understanding and outputs. If the training data is biased or flawed, these issues can manifest in the responses and sometimes reinforcing these biases or even spreading inaccurate information. So for example, if historic, historical data is biased towards certain viewpoints, ChatGPT may replicate these biases in its responses, right? Um, so with these insights, we can better craft our prompts to get more out of ChatGPT. And to craft effective prompts, I'll start by being as specific as possible. Structure your prompts clearly and logically, and consider what you know about ChatGPT's training and try to align your questions according, accordingly to, to avoid triggering biases or inaccurate responses. So... These strategies can help improve the quality of the outputs and also minimizes the risk of encountering problematic outputs. Uh, next slide, please. 
So I'll introduce a, a systematic approach known, I, I develop, I'll call it the CLEAR framework, which stands for uh, concise, logical, explicit, adaptive, and reflective. Uh, this, I, there are a lot of prompt engineering tricks and tips out there, and a lot of them are really useful. But this is less about that, more of a mindset or a structured approach to, uh, to think about how, you, how we want to interact or communicate with AI. So let's start with concise. So the goal here is to be brief without losing the essence of what we need. This means stripping down the prompt to essential elements, which helps prevent the AI from veering off topic. For example, a weak prompt may be, tell me what happened in Europe in the 20th century. It's overly broad. It's likely to result in a very surface level response, right? A stronger concise prompt would be, Summarize the key events in European political history from 1900 to 1950. This directs the AI to focus on specific details with, within a clear time frame, right? and help, help with relevant relevancies and depth of the response. You notice that the better prompt is actually longer than than the the broad one. So being concise is still it's not just being as short or brief as possible, but giving it the essential. Uh, um, information. Next, we consider logical structure. A well-structured prompt follows a logical flow that makes it easier for the AI to process and respond accurately. So a poorly structured prompt might be, discuss Paris, its population, landmarks, and history. So it's kind of jumbled with no clear start or end. A better approach would be, provide an overview of Paris, starting with its history, followed by notable landmarks and concluding with its current population. So this structure of prompt guides the, the AI through a logical sequence and improving the coherence of the information provided. And the next one, moving to explicit uh, instructions. Being explicit involves clearly defining what you want the AI to do. Now compare these two prompts. A weak one may say, I need information on diabetes. This is vague, what type of information is needed. A stronger, more explicit prompt would be explain the causes, symptoms, and treatment options for type 2 diabetes uh, in the in bullet points format for me. So this explicitly tells the AI the exact type of information required, the, the format you want to ensure that the response is detailed and directly useful. So, um, and next slide, please. So these three are ways to craft prompt to help you get, um, to make sure that you're uh, 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 being able to articulate what you want to, to the AI model. The next two components are called adaptive and reflective because a interacting with AI is not just a one-shot thing. It's a dialogue, right? Um, and we want to look at the iterative nature of this. Uh, it's not about getting it perfect the first time, but really evolving our prompts based on the responses we receive and our growing understanding of how AI interprets our queries. So let's explore this kind of cycle of evaluation, adaptation, and reflection that could enrich our interaction with AI. So one is the importance of continuous evaluation and adaptation. So prompting is inherently dynamic. I mentioned that these um, AI models, they, they store um, probabilities, right? So every time you, even if you put in exactly the same prompt, it may come out differently. So it's really hard to say, oh, I have this perfect prompt and I'll get that perfect response. It's never like that. So it's very dynamic and not static. So you're, it's almost like uh, having a conversation with a person. So in each interaction with AI is an opportunity to refine and improve. So continuous evaluation means consistently assessing the effectiveness of our prompts and the appropriateness of the AI responses. So this ongoing process helps us uh, better align our questions and our prompts with AI's processing capabilities to hopefully ensure more accurate and relevant answers over time. So if, a, for, for instance, if a prompt about current technological trends use a really broad response, 
we learn to specify, right? Current technological res responses or trends in renewable energy. And so we adapt uh, based on the responses we get. So the adaptive principle is really about evaluating the AI output and adjusting prompts accordingly. Uh, let's say, you know, an initial prompt is describe the climate changes impacting the Northern hemis Hemisphere. Uh, and it's not giving you exactly what you want. You can have a follow-up. You can say, focus on the specific effects of climate change on Scandinavia's winter weather, weather patterns, right? So learn from the, the output and adapt accordingly. And the next one is um, the, the, the role of reflective practices in improving prompt. Uh, reflect on what has worked or not. So this is even longer term than the adaptive um, um, component. Adaptive is during that interaction, but reflectively thinking about your interaction as a whole afterwards. Um, use this insights to think about, you know, how AI responses to the whole entire interaction, you know, and, um, and think about some of the responses from a larger kind of large higher higher level perspective to say okay is it is it something that i can i um is useful for me how can i use how can i approach it differently or just you know or adjust my approach next time instead of just focusing on individual prompts uh what did the ai understand well what did it not understand well how could the prompt be adjusted for a better outcome so it's less about in improving individual prompts, but more about developing a, a deeper understanding of, of how AI process information. So, so mastering AI communication, I think is a journey of continuous learning and adaptation. As we become more skilled in crafting prompts, we, we can achieve better immediate results, but also contribute to the long-term development of these AI communication strategies. So at this point, uh, Amy, can you put up my our final poll question? It should be live. All right. So can you tell me, you know, what do you use ChatGPT for if you use it at all? Just check all that applies that you, you have used it for or you, you prefer to use it for. And jumping in to say, we know there are more uses. Uh, Leo had lots of extra uses. We ran out of space on the poll. So if there's other, please talk about it in the chat. Oh, we've got nearly 100% participation. And I'm going to share results. you should be able to see now. Yeah. All right. Generating ideas and brainstorming, 70%. That's great. I think it's a great use. Um, and then 59 for writing and editing content. Yes. I use it to um, help me copy edit all the time. Um, answering questions, providing information, 50%. Problem solving, decision making, for the, the only 10%. Conducting research analysis, summarizing long text and documents. I do that a lot as well. Uh, I'm looking at the, the chat as well, some of the other ones. Translation, I uh, see. Create training, teaching sessions, syllabus. Yeah. I have used it for translation quite a few times, which is very, very useful, actually. So, um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, keep writing in the chat. Um, can you go to the next slide, please, Amy? So every time we talk about AI, we do have to think about the, the ethical consideration when using these because it's kind of murky right now. Um, and there's no right answer, to be honest, um, but we can kind of start thinking about it and and have set, set some kind of standards for responsible use. Uh, one of them, the potential, one potential ethical concern is that um, AI systems, including chat GBT, they they could create you know generate misinformation or perpetuating biases or misinterpreting uh, a context. 
And um, I, like I said, they could come from, you know, incorrect training data or, or other things like that. So at this point, I think we need to be careful if we want to use AI in sensitive context or high stakes, you know, situation like mental health support or legal advice uh, and things like that. So we, it's great that that's why I asked the question how we're using how you are all using ChatGPT. A lot of you are just using to generate ideas, which is a great low stakes that way to use, you know, um, ChatGPT on editing content. That's fine. But something like, you know, making decisions, it really, we need to be careful. Um, so, and the second thing is guidelines for responsible use. I think it is, it's, right now, we don't really have a lot of ethic, eth, AI ethics policy at, you know, university level. But, and I think it may be too early to even do that. But I do think that we need to think about having some guidance or guidelines. Um, here's some key ones that we should think about. We mentioned, you know, uh, inaccurate information. So I would say always cross verify AI generated information with credible sources. A lot, we have a lot of librarians here. We should, you know, really promote information literacy. This is a great opportunity to really get people to learn about uh, how to verify, evaluate information. And also supervision, ensure that these AI tools are supervised by humans, professionals who can interpret and modify the output as necessary before final use. Don't just copy and paste. We see a lot of students doing that and we need to be informed or knowledgeable enough to teach them how to use AI uh, responsibly. So, you know, think about creating a checklist for AI generated content that includes verification, cross-checking criteria for criteria for inclusion in in the work if you are in if you're a teacher especially for your for your students. Uh, another thing is you know look at AI as a collaborator instead of you know just replacing us replacing our work. Uh, it can AI can enhance productivity and creativity. They should augment rather than replace human efforts. Uh, it's really vital to maintain the, the originality and integrity of our work. So that's why I'm very happy to see a lot of you using it to brainstorm in research, in writing, use it as a brainstorming tool for that initial draft. A lot of the times it's really difficult to put the first word on a blank page and AI can help us do that. And once we have that, you, we use our own kind of uh, critical thinking, our own talent, our own skill set to to, to build from, build on that, and also verify information as well. Uh, so as we embrace the, the advantages, benefits of, of AI like ChatGPT, let's also think about committing to using these tools ethically and responsibly. Uh, so next slide, please. And I just want to have highlight a few more things like the role of human judgment and critical thinking. A lot of people say that um, AI, especially for teaching and learning, a lot of people say AI will just, you know, uh, destroy the teaching of critical thinking because students will use it for everything. But I think if we, uh, if uh, we are knowledgeable enough on how to use it, we can embrace it to actually enhance that. Uh, and I think we need to be mindful that human judgment and critical thinking are indispensable in AI interaction. While AI can process information and provide you know, responses at really incredible speeds, it really lacks the ability to understand, to reason, and definitely not able to apply judgment. Um, AI, like I said, they are probability machines, they're prediction machines. They are really good at predicting, but they don't, they don't have that ability to apply judgment yet. And that's still a very human thing. Therefore, it is our responsibilities to interpret AI outputs critically and questioning, assessing the, the accuracy, appropriateness of the information. Um, so uh, that's really important. And um, like, you know, building on that, you know, leverage AI strength, but upholding ethical practices. And um, each professional in the academic field have our own set of ethical standards and integrity guidelines. And so it's crucial that our use of AI aligns with these standards. Um, for example, a university faculty uses 
ChatGPT to create course content, which I know a lot of us are doing. But while the AI can provide the content based on a broad knowledge base, we should, we must customize these materials to ensure that they meet our ethical or educational standards that are free from, let's say, biases that could mislead students. Um, so summing up, you know, by applying human judgment, leveraging AI responsibly and kind of adhering to field specific standards, we can help ensure that our professional integrity remains intact uh, and that our work continues to be trusted and valued. So next slide, please. So as we wrap up this session, let's summarize the key points we've covered. Uh, I also invite you to bring any questions you may have um, as we open the floor for Q&A. Um, so key principles uh, for crafting prompts. We started our journey by understanding the importance of craft, crafting well-structured and clear prompts. So remember the clear framework, concise, logical, explicit, adaptive, reflective, can serve as kind of an approach, systematic approach to enhance our interaction. Um, we want to, you know, we've discussed the crucial aspects of ethics in AI usage. So it's imperative to verify the information, maintain or originality in our work, and ensure that our use of AI supports rather than replace the human element. And also as we kind of move forward, I encourage you to experiment with ChatGPT and, and other AI models. Explore the different ways AI can enhance your work, whether it's through automating routine tasks or generating ideas. Um, but also, however, also always keep in mind the, the principles we have discussed today. So you these, use these tools intelligently and also responsibly and apply, continue to apply our critical thinking skills to to really evaluate and refine the output they produce. So thank you very much. Uh, be happy to uh, have a discussion and, and answer any any questions. Uh, Thanks like so it. much, Leo. Sorry to interrupt. I'm going to run through a couple final slides and then we've got a big Q&A at the end. There are so many questions that have come in and I have quite a few for myself, um, myself for you, Leo, as well. Mm -hmm. So we'll save plenty of time. But just to revisit what I showed earlier, um, that Sage Campus, we see as the content, this course is the content in solving this type of challenge. Um, and we've integrated with Lean Library, the technology from Sage product that I work with, um, and that is the tech solution. So it brings library services and content to where students are online today by a browser with their extension. And I just wanna show you it in action quickly. So it'll be very quick. So, Reminder, just as what technology from Sage is, we're a division of Sage Publishing. Um, we provide a created suite of library technologies that improve the stage of the patron's workflow. So we're library technologies, there's lots of librarians this call today. Then the end users are researchers, students, faculty, like we have a lot of people in this webinar too. Um, and those technologies range from managing reading lists to discovering online resources and reference management. The one we're speaking about is Lean Library. That's what we have the integration for. So Lean Library puts library collections and services. So journal articles, eBooks, all their holdings, Sage Campus, courses like this, uh, into the modern patrons workflow. So the mo modern student workflow is online, like we said on Google, find an extension on their browser. Uh, so it boosts patron pr productivity. It streamlines access to all these resources and ultimately drives usage of the services and holdings that the library has whether they start on Google Scholar, PubMed, the dreaded Wikipedia or beyond. So for this integration, we work with a very specific part of technology. Uh, Lean Library integrates with SpringShare's LibGuides and all other library guidance. So you see a little mock-up here of a patron on a website and in the side, the library logo comes up with some guidance and instruction about the academic resource, whether that's a data repository, whether that is ChatGPT. So, what this integration does with the Sage Campus course is it surfaces the course via that Lean Library extension pop-up to users who are on the open AI domain, so i.e. as they're on ChatGPT. Um, it's available for all institutions, so all customers using Lean Library Workflow, uh, Flipguides, or Lean Library Futures, um, and it just sees their patrons, so their students, their researchers, need to have the browser extension and they will see that course pop up as they are trying to use ChatGPT. 
Um, and then the librarian or the library gets stats on how many patrons have seen and clicked the course and how many have downloaded the certificate. And the students themselves, yeah, they can download the certificate, uh, certificate through that. Um, and I'm going to reshare the link because it was shared quite a while ago in the chat of where you can take the course today yourself as well. So here is a video. It goes very fast. So I might play it twice um, of openai.com. So this is a patron or a user, and this is their experience of how, when they're trying to start using an open AI source like ChatGPT, how we can prompt them to take this course and get that guidance via the Lean Library extension. So playing here, you can see the pop-up there, and here's the course, bit of an introduction. And if they click start course, it's prompted them to take it out in the full screen. You can see all the modules down there. I'll pause there. Did everyone, did that, did that video run, Leo and Maria? Can I just check? Sometimes I have Zoom issues with video. Yes, it did. Great. Okay, so this is capturing patrons or students just at that point of when they're about to use it, to say, hey, have you learned what Leo's just taught us today? Do you know the clear framework? Is your prompt the perfect prompt to get what you want? So I'm going to stop sharing slides so we can see everyone's faces with the Q&A because there have been a lot of questions that have come in. And, and I've been monitoring the chat a bit, and Maria has too. Uh, and I actually just want to kick off with my own question, Leo, because you've come with two hats today. And I've seen um, lots of different groups of people in here as well. So I've seen some questions from faculty who are, stu who are using who students are using ChatGPT in really great ways. I think uh, Mark in the chat said they're mapping research questions against certain frameworks on ChatGPT for brainstorming their possible research questions. I've seen a lot of faculty concerns, like, God, our students are using this, they're using it in the wrong way. How do we tell them it's the right way to use it? When should they not be using it? Should they should it be regurgitating all their answers just through ChatGPT? Um, I've seen librarians on this call talking about how do you trust, who's an expert? How do you trust an expert? Where do, how do we provide this to students? How do we make sure students see it? Um, and Leo, as your role, not just as an AI expert, but you are the Dean and the Professor in the College of University Libraries and Learning Services, what is your university doing to um, train, guide students in, what's your library's resources and, and thinking of, uh, to guide them in the use of ChatGPT and other AI? So right now we're doing several things. Uh, one is, so my college is not only the libraries, but we have a learning sciences uh, degree program from bachelor's to PhD. And through that, we are offering a one credit pilot course on AI literacy for students on how to uh, just get an introduction, you know, to uh, using AI and from different perspectives. I think it's really important for students to learn it because as they go through their college careers and graduate, their employers will be expecting them to be able to use it intelligently and responsibly. So that's important. However, that's just a small, you know, small thing because most students are using it. And I think more students are using it than instructors. And that's a issue, uh, which means that um, we're putting, to be honest, we're putting students in a tough position because they, they don't know whether they can use it or not or how they can use it because their instructors are not specifying and because the instructors are not informed or knowledgeable enough at this point to really to say, oh, this is the, the way I want you to use it. Therefore, I think the first part we need to do is to increase the AI literacy level of all faculty or instructors before even thinking about the students. Because they are using it, they are exploring it, they are learning actually. But a lot of instructors are too busy to even learn it, or they don't have that support to help them learn it. Therefore, that is the the uh, the number one step we're doing to kind of help empower the instructors. And we have set up several kind of training programs. We have webinars. We have you know courses. But to me, those are even though they they could be useful. I particularly like setting up communities of practice so that people can share, people can share the tips, challenges, lessons learned, and then they have, um, they build a community and they learn together. Um, adult learning is very different than, you know, student or children learning. Uh, there, there are some other environment that we want to create. So we have done that at my college. We call it, at that point, we call it the GPT-4 exploration program. Uh, a lot of people don't have access to 
uh, GPT-4, which is the paid version. A lot of people have access to ChatGPT. And in a study that I conducted, I found that only six less than 7% of people have, uh, have used the paid version of it. And those people have higher AI literacy level because they tend to use it more. So hands-on experience. So we created that program to pay for it for our staff and faculty to uh, meet every other week to communicate, to share. Uh, and we're now expanding it to instructors and expanding it to other AI tools. Um, so I believe in that. If you're interested, I'll be very happy to share the structure of that setup. Uh, you can just, you know, contact me. Um, I think Amy is going to share my LinkedIn. I always, you know, um, uh, share my work there and other things. So you can contact me there. I'll be happy to share. I've shared it a lot of times already. And a lot of places are kind of, you know, trying different ways to help their faculty learn. So I think that is really the most important thing to help our faculty. Uh, like a webinar like this will be, it's always very helpful for people to learn a little bit more so that they can, get, they can investigate and explore and experiment. Completely. And I saw so many questions and maybe Mira's going to highlight some in a second, but I saw so many questions coming from, I assume in fact it looks like faculty saying they're working with UG undergrad students or working with a cohort of what we don't know what we should be guiding them on. Um, and as I was reading those comments coming in, my thought would be, have you spoke to your librarian? Have you gone to the library? Because the library has that wealth of resources that they can give students. So always direct students to the library, not just as a place for content and books, but as a patron services um, provider. And I had a really great question. Sorry, I will hand over to you in one second, Maria, but I saw a really great one from, I think it was Frank Plunkett. If I've given someone else credit, uh, Frank credit for someone else's question, I apology, I apologize. Um, so it seems over the last year that there's an expert around every corner. How do they really know who are the experts? I've been overwhelmed with training webinars, professional de development, conference sessions and courses. And Frank is a faculty member and um, also doing his own, using ChatGPT for his own research, but also um, wanting to know for teaching. And my view again would always be go to your library, but I don't know, Leah, if you can give some tips on all the resources out there that maybe aren't the best ChatGPT resources to go to. There's a lot of people on YouTube, there's a lot of that. What do you think? Yeah, there are a lot of resources out there. And to be honest, I don't know who the experts are. And all, and to be honest, everybody is learning right at this point. There, um, And that's my advice is to check them out to see which one speaks to you. You can try that. If it doesn't work, that means that doesn't work for you. Um, and I actually learn a lot from YouTube, even though some of them are not experts, but they're very good at teaching. And I learned from them on how to relay information in a very engaging way to students because YouTube is a very competitive place. They need to do well in order to get views and they do it well. So we can learn, learn a lot from them. And some of them are good, very good actually. And you can see the, the, the ones that get hundreds of thousands of millions of views, those are good ones. That many people are actually, you know, watching them, and you know. So I would start from those. Start from the very popular ones and see what you learn. Also, go to the 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 big cup uh, um, tech companies too, like IBM have uh, push out a lot of um, info, you know, really good explanations of the technical aspects of LLMs. Right, you go to a reputable place like Sage. They put out good information on things that they they kind of uh, 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 so you can trust these credible places basically. So our staff from you know at those places and also a lot of libraries have created lib guides. So like Amy said, go to the libraries because in fact we are actually the the go to place now on my campus. A lot of people just come to us to ask how how do we help our students. And because one of the things is about verifying information, and that's the li library's job to help them learn how to verify information. Um, so definitely speak with your libraries, librarians. Um, in fact, it's funny because when ChatGPT first came out, a lot of students come to us and ask our library workers to help them find journals and books. And they would spend hours not able to find them. We said, what's going on? And then we realized that these are hallucinations that the you know the, the AI models make those citations up. Those were teachable moments. 
if we were ready back then, we were able we would be able to teach students that hey, don't use AI for that. Use AI, you know, on other things. So we are getting there. We're helping our librarians to get up to that level that you know when we encounter things like that, we can teach them and guide them in the right way. But like I said, even though I said guide them in the right way, we're just pointing at that direction. Nobody knows anything at this point. Everything is changing every day. So the 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 smart thing to do is try to keep up and um, come come to webinars like this. Exactly, and I think what's so brilliant about your course, your Sage Campus course, is that it's multimedia. Um, that obviously you yourself, as, as an expert, Leo, sometimes watching a video is not enough. Sometimes um, just reading isn't enough. Isn't enough. But these structured Sage Campus courses, which Maria knows much more about than I do, and you'll know of yours are much more in depth than I do. Um, but they have those formative assessments that test your learning as you go. And I think what's so exciting about the integration where we surface it on, on the OpenAI domain is that it catches you just as you're about to do it, just as you're about to put a plug in that prompt, just about your students about to do it. It would be a perfect world if students thought, I'm starting my research journey or researchers thought they're starting their research journey. I want to become an expert, all the tools that are out there. But they don't, they just dive in as they should and as they do. So capturing them at this point to make sure, I think I've seen some hilariously, hilariously scary stories in the chat of uh, students uh, returning stuff in with from ChatGPT that's not quite right or yeah, has some very big ethical considerations. Um, and this is by sort of surfacing it on the open AI domain, we're catching them as and when. Uh, Maria, any questions that you wanted to ask from the Q&A? Yes, um, as you said, there are loads of questions in the Q&A and in the chat. So I've been trying to put them into sort of uh, categories that would make sense. Um, uh, we've had quite a few questions, as you may have seen, on ethical use of AI. Um, we also had loads of questions on the sort of practical uses of it, as in how you recommend that people use it, what are the best uses. Um, and I think there was one question here that was quite interesting um, that I, to be fair, it's a question that I have as well for you. Um, uh, have you also identified any particular wording that might increase the effectiveness or quality of the prompt? How does this work with interactions using language or the, other than English? And I think this oh. is a, an interesting question about, you know, I know we mentioned potential biases and, and things like that, but also different languages um, are probably represented differently on these uh, AI modules. That's a great question. And I'll, I'll encourage you to experiment with it because I haven't done it that much. I've tried a few times with, let's say, I had to do a presentation in, in both Chinese and English. I asked, and I forgot to translate it for my slides. I asked to do it like really quickly. And I actually asked the audience, tell me which one is right, which one is wrong. And they told me some of them are really good. I was like, oh my God, I did this in seconds. But some of them are like, okay, maybe not quite. That means that you do want that you do want to have that kind of a knowledge, not only for language, but in anything. You want to have some kind of domain knowledge to, to verify it. Uh, but I think that it, it, it was like it, at least 90%, 95% correct. And it's really, really good. So that means that um, uh, you, you still have to verify it. You cannot trust it completely, but it can help you get started. So, um, so with that, uh, with translation, that is the case. Now, with actually the content, it's, it's weird because we're still trying to find out whether it's trying to get the data from, let's say, Spanish. Are they getting from Spanish language data or are they using English data and then translate it to Spanish for you? We don't know at this point, to be honest. So experimentation, try it out and see whether that works for you. Um, in terms of words, there are a lot of tricks out there, but the thing is they keep changing too. So I noticed that, um, that's why I created this framework that is more of a approach than a specific kind of words. Being explicit is very important to specify what you actually want from, from it. And you can ask it to play a role. I think that helps and I've used it a lot to play act as because let's say, uh, it's funny, I was working with my marketing person. We we're trying to develop a marketing plan for the libraries. 
if you just say, you know, do this, it would do it from a very general knowledge. But if you ask it, you're a marketing expert. I want you to apply this marketing theory. And then you can come up with something really cool, actually, and very specific. So that's something I find really useful is to give it a very specific role or give it a very specific kind of uh, framework to use. And then you can go into that kind of set of training data to pull from. So I think that's that's my tip. That's yeah, no, that's a really useful one. And um, just keeping to sort of this uh, question, practical users of ChatGPT, there's a couple of questions that I think you might be able to answer together. One is, um, is it true that you shouldn't send negative instructions to AI when we write a prompt? And the second question is, when getting an answer, does my next prompt need to recall the first prompt? Okay. Uh, wait, first of all, what is what do, what do you mean by negative prompt? Like, don't do something? I presume that that's what uh, they mean. So if that's okay. not the case, um, can the person who asked that question let us know in the yeah. chat? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But if that is the case, that works too. You know, it's just say, I want you to do this, but uh, avoid using these words. Sometimes it works, not always. So, you know, play with it. Uh, what's the second part? Of and it? the second question was, when getting an answer, does my next prompt need oh. to recall the first prompt? So it depends on the um, uh, tool. Like I haven't used the free version of ChatGPT in a while now, but I think it's, it remembers in that thread that it remembers your previous, you know, um, communications. The pay versions, definitely. In fact, the pay version now remembers every one of your threads. So it's becoming your assistant in some ways. It remembers all your previous conversations. So sometimes you need to specify if it's like from way back, but if it's just one after the, the one, you know, immediately preceding it, you don't, it, it would know that you are following up on that. But then again, yes, it is a conversation, but it always helps to be precise and be able to articulate exactly what you want. So that saves you some, some time as well. Yes, uh, that's definitely true. And um, just moving on to some questions about security um, mm -hmm. of using ChatGPT, there was a question about the confidentiality of the data we share um, with AI. So what are the risks involved in sharing our own ideas with the tool and the confidentiality of our work? So it really depends on the tool and the company and the, the version that you're using. Um, we So right now we're paying our um, my staff to use the paid version of GPT. They say that they don't use it to train their data. But what other users, we don't know. Right, so we are basically following the our general IT guidelines. Don't upload any sensitive information like social security number, birthdays, addresses. Don't do that, and that's kind of our baseline. But also use common sense. If it's like a contract or something like that, we try not to do it there, maybe, or at least redact all the you know um, um, sensitive information that way. In terms of copyright stuff different publishers have different ideas at this point, and they haven't really started putting those in contracts yet, but I imagine they will. Um, so we need to follow those. Um, but if you have looked at the ARL or AL, ARL um, um, kind of guidelines on copyright or the our perspective on it, is that a lot of it falls under fair use. So. But then again, we're all kind of keeping an eye on all the lawsuits and see where it would go with copyrighted materials. So we don't know. Just use common sense at this point. Follow your IT policy. Um, yeah, and you're going to ask whether we have to wrap up. I think we do. I think we sadly do. Um, and I'm just answering the latest question before we get a chance to review the questions. Yes. So I'm so sorry we can answer all the questions live. I think we could go on for another hour here, really. Um, but what we will do is we'll explore all the questions. We will do it in a follow up blog um, with Leo. 
um, and with Maria, and this will be sent to you either with the recording, which you should get in two days time from Zoom, as long with your certificate, or it might be the week after, just depending how many questions there are. I'll strive to get them done in time, but maybe the week after on the Technology from Sage blog. So that's technologyfromsage.com and you'll find it there. Um, in the follow-up emails, you'll also get Leo's LinkedIn, as he mentioned, connect with him. Um, you'll get the link to where you can take the full course. So a lot of your questions, I think, will probably be answered by the full course too. There's much more content in that, up to 60 minutes of learning, I believe. Um, and you'll have all the information. And if you'd like to find out anything more about Lean Library and Sage Campus's integration, please just get in touch responding uh, to the webinar invite, which is info at technologyfromsage.com. So huge thank you, Leo. That was amazing. I loved it. Um, and th huge thank you to Maria for moderating as well and to everyone for joining. We had a great turnout. So lovely to see you all. You'll get the recording. Thank you. Thank you. Bye all.